Evolutionary ecology bridges the gap between two major fields in the biological sciences. Our focus here is to study the history and ultimate causation of interactions within and among species, as well as interactions between species and their abiotic environment. It's all about tracking selective pressures and adaptations then within an ecological and often community-based context. Evolutionary ecology starts with the life history of a species. Life history refers to the timing of events that are directly related to survival and reproduction. This includes development slash maturation, reproduction itself, dispersal, and senescence, or biological aging. The specific life history traits of African bush elephants include the age at first reproduction, the number and sex of offspring, any patterns of dispersal, and overall life expectancy. Species exist in space, within natural systems or human-engineered environments. The resources and environmental conditions required for survival and reproduction constitute the ecological niche of that species. The modern definition of niche was developed by G. Evelyn Hutchinson, which he described as an n-dimensional hypervolume. This is the fundamental niche, which represents the full range of environmental conditions and potential resources needed for a species to live and reproduce. However, interactions with other species, like competition, will reduce the resources and physical space that are available, as well as force different resource allocation strategies or behaviors in the focal species. These more restricted conditions describe the realized niche. However, this is also where a species is best adapted. When we model the potential impacts of climate change, for example, we try to predict how species geographic ranges might shift based on their ecological niche. Dispersal, another life history characteristic, can be extremely limiting, though, when it comes to these shifts. And just because a species is living within the bounds of its fundamental niche doesn't mean it will be able to thrive, especially once interspecific interactions are considered. Anyway, some of the older niche concepts used a different logic, in which case a niche described a particular ecological role. Equivalent species then can step in or out of that role, or the niche itself could be empty. Regardless, according to the competitive exclusion principle, American avocets, or any one species, cannot stably coexist with another species that shares the exact same niche. Specialists have a narrower niche breadth, or simply diet, than generalist species. Phenotypic plasticity can pose significant costs, and even acclimation takes time. We can explain the evolution of specialization through three major ecological mechanisms, environmental stability, optimum foraging theory, and interspecific interactions, including competition, or related mechanisms like an evolutionary arms race. But at a physiological level, there may be genetic constraints or trade-offs like pleiotropic effects. There are also macroevolutionary considerations too, such as phylogenetic history. While we tend to look at the evolution of specialization from generalization, and acknowledge that evolutionary reversals are rare, don't forget that evolution isn't limited to a single direction. Generalists have their own suite of relevant, equally useful adaptations, and in certain cases have no problem outcompeting specialist species. A life table can be used to summarize the basic life history of a population or species. For each age group, a life table tallies the number of individuals and their per capita reproduction. Using this information, we can determine life expectancy, 
E sub X, while also tracking the fecundity schedule, M sub X. These life table parameters can change over time. But remember, not all changes are evolutionary changes. However, co-evolutionary interactions can certainly have an effect, like how feeding on lower quality hosts can lower life expectancy for beach blight aphids. But mutualisms with ants can help make resource acquisition more efficient, increasing both life expectancy and age-specific fertility. Oh, and by the way, beach blight aphids are also called boogie-woogie aphids because they perform a highly synchronized eye-catching dance to ward off potential predators. A life table can be used to calculate basic population growth parameters. Net reproductive rate, or R0, is the mean lifetime reproduction per individual, calculated as the sum of the entries in the LXMX column. An R0 of 1 indicates perfect replacement. Each individual, on average, contributes a single offspring to the next generation. If this is the case, the population is likely to neither grow nor decline. In contrast, higher values of R0 would be associated with greater rates of population growth. Related parameters include generation time, G, and population doubling time. One of the most important parameters, though, at least in studies of population dynamics, is the intrinsic rate of increase, R, which relates populational change by a difference in birth and death rates. If R is positive, the population is growing, and if R is negative, the population is in decline. If R is zero, then the size of the population is stable. It's not changing over time. Looking back to our beach blight aphids, aphids have a high R0, short generation time, and high intrinsic rate of growth. Life history trade-offs affect reproductive effort. Reproductive effort is defined as the proportion of nutrients and energy allocated for reproduction, specifically. Again, there is a definite cost of reproduction. For example, high population densities or resource scarcity prompt some aphids to swap their high net reproductive rates for better dispersal ability. Instead of allocating all of their resources towards reproduction, they build dense flight muscles and develop wings. As you might guess, this can have enormous fitness consequences at the level of the individual. There's a lot of calculations and trade-offs involved. But aphids might be an atypical example since most reproduce asexually for extended periods of time, so selection can act at the level of a clonal colony instead of an individual. Anyway, fitness is maximized when survival and reproduction is increased at earlier ages, so the end result is senescence and a finite lifespan. There are a couple of mechanisms involved. The first is mutation accumulation. Because deleterious mutations have little fitness cost the later in life they're expressed, they can become fixed through genetic drift instead of being selected against. The logic here is a bit circular, though, because it assumes that older individuals are already less fecund than younger individuals. But if we think in terms of survival probability, I think it makes more sense. For example, the odds that an aphid is attacked by a predator on any given day might be relatively low, but compounded over the lifetime of the aphid, well, it would probably be better to leave some offspring behind before that happens. Okay, the second mechanism is antagonistic pleiotropy. In this case, there's a trade-off due to an inverse genetic correlation in the genes involved in resource allocation to reproduction versus self-maintenance. This one, antagonistic pleiotropy, is thought to have a greater influence on senescence than mutation accumulation, although both processes are important. Adult Adélie penguins are iteroparous. They can breed every season. 
compared to semel parity, which refers to the strategy of only reproducing once in a lifetime, iteroparity can be a more useful strategy in unpredictable or changing environments. Iteroparity requires less reproductive effort during each round of re reproduction, but assuming that adult mortality is low and there are additional fitness gains to deferring, the net costs and benefits can be comparable. Regardless, there are no populations that can continue to grow unchecked for long. Remember an essay on the principle of population by Thomas Malthus? He wrote about two types of mechanisms for maintaining populations at a sustainable size, positive checks that increase death rates and preventative checks that decrease birth rates. These are density dependent factors for the most part. For example, intraspecific competition, predation, and parasite transmission have increasingly strong effects on larger populations than on smaller ones. Also, resource limitation itself sets a sort of ceiling when it comes to the largest population size that a habitat can support. This is called carrying capacity, or K. Another aspect of natural history is phenology, which is the study of cyclic or periodic events. This includes the timing of reproduction, migration, and dormancy or hibernation. These events are aligned with seasonal or interannual variation in climate or environmental factors. Just look at the animal order Onura, the frogs. Global change can have a substantial effect on the phenology of the poison dart frog along with other amphibians. The recent amphibian die-offs that are happening worldwide are linked to habitat loss and habitat degradation, although disease, introduced predators, and climate change are also important contributors. Amphibians are particularly sensitive to small and especially rapid changes in their external environment. Changes in water availability affect adult reproduction, and temperature influences gametogenesis as well as tadpole development. If temperatures in the early spring change, this can disrupt hibernation or alter the timing of breeding. When phenology is disrupted like this, it's an especially concerning threat that can lead to extinction. Okay. Through co-evolution, two or more species elicit reciprocal change in each other. Short-term interspecific interactions like predation and pollination evolve through co-evolution. Longer-term interspecific interactions are called symbioses, which means living together, and includes mutualism and parasitism. Competition might be considered a short-term or long-term interaction, depending on the context. Through diffuse co-evolution, groups of species, or guilds, are involved. A standard example involves American red squirrels, crossbills, and lodgepole pine, where cone morphology has evolved differently depending on the relevant seed-feeding community. Predation is typically a short-term interaction, so it's not considered a type of symbiosis. In predator-prey interactions, in this example, these tigers are benefiting at the expense of a wild boar. Predator-prey interactions are associated with several important evolutionary processes. In an evolutionary arms race, or escalation, both predators and prey are selected for increasingly extreme trait values. Both evolutionary arms race and red queen dynamics play a role in the evolution of predator-prey systems. 
prey that are able to defend themselves, like through the sequestration of toxic plant compounds or physical fighting behavior, may mark themselves with conspicuous warning colors. This is called aposematism, and it can teach potential predators to avoid this type of prey in the future. Of course, some species take advantage of this, mimicking the warning colors of defended species. This is Batesian mimicry, in which a harmless mimic appears similar to a model. Eulerian mimicry is a different situation of convergent coevolution in which two models end up resembling each other. So once a predator learns from one, it will avoid both. Like predation, parasitism is another win-lose interaction, but this time it's considered a symbiosis because the individuals involved are participating in a long-term interaction, willing or not. Virulent parasites or pathogens lower the fitness of their host, but there's a balance between virulence and transmission too high, and a host will die before a parasite or pathogen can be transmitted, but too low, and an individual will be outcompeted by co-parasites or co-pathogens. The balance between virulence and transmission can involve group selection if the disease is so severe that none of the individual pathogens can be transmitted to another host before being extirpated. While Incidental hosts can play a role in crossing the species barrier or in zoonotic transfer. There is generally no coevolution between parasites slash pathogens and any incidental hosts. Okay, for the example in the photo here, these are ghost plants, which lack chlorophyll and parasitize um, parasitize the mycorrhizal fungi associated with certain trees. Next, we have herbivory. One of the most common trends is how plant defensive compounds evolve to protect against herbivores. Once a particularly effective new protection evolves, this can create an escape and radiate scenario, allowing for a subsequent rapid diversification of that lineage of plants. Escape and radiate coevolution has occurred within the Brassicales order of plants and this particular group of butterflies. This arctic white butterfly, along with other whites, have in turn evolved resistance to the glucoenolates or mustard oils produced by this clade of plants, leading to further speciation of both along the way. Competition is a situation where no one comes out ahead. Exploitative competition depletes shared resources, whereas interference competition involves physical interactions or a change in behavior. When competition is intense, this can lead to character displacement, divergence in the average value of a character trait that's used to exploit a varied resource. But when competitors are absent, this can result in ecological release, essentially an increase in the density or distribution of one species that's no longer restricted by the other. In this picture, we see an elephant and a warthog in a bit of a standoff over a shared resource, in this case, a man-made watering hole. While rare, there are also a few all-around positive interactions in nature, like this black-winged mina eating fleas off of rusa deer, which is mutually beneficial for the both of them. Unfortunately, the evolution of mutualism isn't all sunshine and rainbows. It's not altruism, but rather maybe a sort of mutual exploitation. It's certainly possible for immensalisms and parasitism to evolve from what was once a mutualism, and vice versa. So what prevents cheaters from over-exploiting a mutualism? For one, 
Cheaters can be punished. These individuals might be recognized by other members of either species involved in the mutualism. Second, uh, rewards might only come to good actors, those who faithfully participate in a near-equal exchange. It's also likely that there is a reduction in fitness of a cheater, as the fitness of their partner is equally reduced. Interactions are the foundation for ecological communities, like Bambush Forest here in Luxembourg. And there are many evolutionary processes that can affect community structure and function, including phylogenetic history, character displacement and species sorting, and convergence, either on its own or as part of an adaptive radiation. Well, that's it for this video. Thank you for watching, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me.